if we're having a discussion and you say no, well, I could settle and take your no at it. Or I could try to split the difference with you on something. I could try to argue with you and try to impose my opinion on it. But from a sales perspective, from an actual boots on the ground where you're talking to somebody, working with somebody, I need to be a better person at redirecting you to a yes that's acceptable for you. And so my role as a salesperson or as a salesman, if you want to call it that, is to get you to that point where it's like, yes, this does make sense for me. This is beneficial for me. And so being able to humble myself and not try to impose my will on somebody. What's up, guys? Welcome to the Sales Wolves podcast. As always, I'm your host, Tyler Harris. Joseph Caldwell. And today we've got a special guest. Evan Wilson. And we are the Sales Wolves. Ow! Yeah, yeah. It's always better when you have more wolves in one place. It's always good to have a pack. This is episode 154 of the Sales Wolves podcast. And as you can see, and as you just heard, there are three of us here. And uh, I want to kind of lay out why in the world there are three people here. And it's really cool. So this is the Sales Wolves podcast, but a lot of the origination of this podcast came from within our organization, some of the things that we do, some of the ways uh, that we compete and challenge ourselves and um, ultimately reward those that are doing the work and that are having incredible results. And one of, that is, one of those ways is a Sales Wolves competition that we actually have. Yep. Uh, within our organization. And so, you know, when people are coming on board with our business and they've gone through the training and onboarding and they're finally out in the field making it happen, they come back to a boot camp uh, here and it's really in depth training. It's like drinking out of a fire hose, but they have some of the context and frame of reference of having now done it some. And that really launches them onto their career. And so, for the 90 days that follow that boot camp, we track the results. And basically, the one that sells the most becomes the sales wolf or the sales wolf. And, and so and, and it's always been the one that sells the most sales the most. The one that sells the most and that helps the most people is the one that embodies our mission, vision, values and culture. Absolutely. Our our uh, the way that we do things as a pack. So, Evan Wilson just won the sales wolf award. So he came in uh, here to Greenville, South Carolina. We're going to spend some time with him, which is awesome. But we thought no better way to kick off this podcast than to have a sales wolf on the Sales Wolves podcast. Imagine that. Imagine that. And so we're just going to have a conversation amongst us that you guys can join along for the ride and hopefully gain something from. Uh, but I wanted to just really open it up by asking Evan, what, how would you define a sales wolf. Like, what is a sales wolf to you? Mm, what is a sales wolf? Hungry. Mm. Hungry. Yep. You make fun of me because the first time we met, <laughs> I ate food <laughs> off of your plate. Now that is he because was that Literally. was, uh, you know, coming out, I told you my story and everything. Yeah. I was just until I started this career, meal insecure. Didn't know where my next meal was going to come from. Yeah. I asked you at one point, and I kind of jokingly asked this, have you ever eaten food out of a dumpster? I have. Mm -hmm. huh. It's not a fun experience. And so when you didn't finish your plate, I was still in that mindset of, hey, man, I don't know where my next food's going to come from. I don't know where my meal's going to come from. There's wow. been points in my life where I've slept in my car. Mm -hmm. And so you'll never appreciate how soft a bed is until you've had a belt buckle up your ass. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you don't mind the cussing. But that is, in my mind, just having that hunger to get better to always chase, to always succeed, and to always try to improve yourself no matter what you're doing. We could stop the podcast right there. Yeah. We could. We yep. could stop it right there. Um, you know, but the, but the interesting thing is, like, I love nothing more than seeing what you did play out. Like, I love nothing more than seeing someone with their back against the wall where it has to work. Like, we have people that we've brought on to our team and onto our organization that if it didn't work, they'd have been okay. Like they could go back to what they were doing or you know, their spouse has a good job or you know, they could find you know, something else to do. But when it has to work, like for me, that was my story, it had to work. There's something about that hunger that's more than just hunger to get more, or hunger to get better, or hunger to yeah. be more successful, but the hunger to not only survive, but then to be able to thrive. But what is it 
that like being in that experience and having that mindset, having having being in that place in your life is one thing, but it doesn't always equal results for the person that's in that place. So, you know, what it, what's that secondary layer of, yes, I was hungry, but I was also willing to do what I needed to do to succeed. Like, how would you kind of equate that to your experience? So I think that would be a dichotomy. I think that would be binary on that one is first opportunity and then second resiliency. Mm. So no matter where you are, what you're doing, there's an opportunity there. Mm -hmm. There's a chance for you to improve. There's a chance for you to follow up with something. There is a chance, and I hate to use the term exploit because it sounds nefarious, but to exploit that opportunity, to be able to go down and chase a rabbit hole, to be able to follow up with something. And then resiliency is every day, hey, I just got you know, punched in the ribs yesterday. I got kicked in the teeth at an opportunity. Well, tomorrow's an opportunity. When I wake up, you know, getting up today, this is a new opportunity. I've only got a few days in this life, and so I've only got a few opportunities to be able to do this, to be able to get up and to chase these goals and chase these dreams. Hmm. And so. And it, and it seems like someone that is hungry, <clears throat> someone that does have their back up against the wall, there historically seems to be a level of short sightedness in that hunger. Like, I'm hungry for food today. Like, I'm hungry, I wanna eat tomorrow. That was gonna be my next point, is I have never arrived. And yeah. the day I arrive, I hope y'all fire me. <laughs> so okay. <I'm, laughs> right. That was mostly fall on me, so. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I have, I get, well, thinking about it in a numerical sense, I get one, awesome, two's better. I got two, four's better. I got four, eight's better. Yeah. All right, I got one set, you know, doing bench press or whatever. All right, now I wanna be able to get a double on that. Now I wanna get yeah. a triple. You know, how am I constantly chasing that next number? Yeah. So I'm not going to ever be to that point where I'm happy, to be honest. Yeah. He just explained too, like, the becoming is all in the journey. So if there's a mountaintop and we're going to the mountaintop, most people have their goals as the mountaintop. And then they sit at the mountaintop and they don't understand that it was the joy of the journey and what they became was in between the valley and the mountaintop. So when they hit the mountaintop, it's what's the next, the only reason to make it to the mountaintop and you should celebrate your successes. It's like we're celebrating yours, but you're already looking at the next peak and where you're gonna have to go and what you're gonna have to become to hit that next peak. You've sent me messages on what you wanna do and how you wanna do it. You're already looking at that next peak. And that's a lot of times when people experience success, it can be more detrimental to their future if they don't handle it correctly than a failure, right? It's, it's crazy. Yeah, there was a quote I read the other day. It said, um, the mishandling of success is the leading cause of failure. <laughs> and the, whatever the opposite of mishandling would be, the proper handling of failure is the leading cause of success. Yeah. Which is interesting. To piggyback on that a little bit, we have a mutual friend that asked me about uh, a financial bonus, you know, if you make this financial bonus, will you, what are you gonna do with that money? What are you gonna buy? What are you gonna, you know, make happen in your life? And I said to her, you know, I never really even thought about it. Like, I, I really don't even care about the actual money portion of it. I care about every single day getting a little bit closer to it. Yeah. Like, I, honestly, I, it kind of baffled me for a second. I was like, yeah, never, that's not why I'm chasing that goal. I'm chasing that goal to get closer to that goal. Yeah. So, that's. And so it's almost like if we, if we narrow down to the actual definition of a sales wolf, that hunger, but it's like an insatiable hunger. Like it's a, a constant hunger every single day, no matter what you got to eat the day before. Mm -hmm. And it's that continual progress. Like for me, I, you know, happiness, fulfillment, like it's all about progress. But that hunger is what gets you up in the morning to attack and create that progress. But knowing that, just like you said, getting a bonus, getting to the mountaintop, it's being excited to get to the mountaintop so that you can see what the other one looks like. That's right. And understand that the next one's gonna be taller, it's gonna be more treacherous, it's gonna be more difficult, but being the hunger of being able to not only see it, but literally that fire you up, that like, yeah, I'm glad I got here, but I'm even more glad that now I get to go there knowing that when you get there, it's, it's just a continual, it's the rest of your life. Because yeah, when you get process. to the mountaintop and people are celebrating whatever goal you achieved, 
it was really somewhere in between the valley and the mountaintop that you became the best version of yourself that deserved that mountaintop. And you need another challenge. Mm -hmm. You need another uncomfortable situation to become a better version of yourself. It's the, it's the human condition. We mm -hmm. need a challenge and we need to challenge ourselves. And we live in such a safe here where we live. It's pretty safe. You know what I'm saying? It's, 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 um, it, we're not faced with, you know, escaping a saber toothed tiger when we walk out in the morning, right? Like we're not, we're not scared of that. That's not our challenge. And so we need to create those challenges to become the better versions of ourselves so that we can live a life well lived. So, so you mentioned resiliency. What are some other skills or disciplines that you feel are imperative to have success in any sales career? Not settling, number one, and that's in the sense of if we're having a discussion and you say no, well I could settle and take your no at it. Or I could try to split the difference with you on something. I could try to argue with you and try to impose my opinion on it, but from a sales perspective, from an actual boots on the ground where you're talking to somebody, working with somebody, I need to be a better person at redirecting you to a yes that's acceptable for you. And so my role as a salesperson or as a salesman, if you want to call it that, is to get you to that point where it's like, yes, this does make sense for me. This is beneficial for me. And so yeah. being able to humble myself and not try to impose my will on somebody. Yeah. So for the longest time, I always wanted to take that dominant approach of, hey, oh, you said no? Okay, let me tell you why you're stupid. Mm -hmm. Let me go through this yeah. and then try to force you, <laughs> you know, oh, wait, that's not actually it. That's not the right way. You know, I want to show you why this is beneficial for you. So let me get to that point where I'm redirecting you away from your no to an acceptable yes. Mm -hmm. And so I think at the core root of that is being humble enough to look at it from that person's shoes and figure out why it is that they want this or why this would be beneficial for them. Right. And so that would be a critical factor on that. So that'd be a that also has a lot to do with the belief in what you do, what you're selling, right. and knowing that if, because I have looked at people before and gone, you know what, this is not the best this isn't the best thing for you. And you have to be humble enough to be able to, to look at it from that, exactly what you're saying. So if this isn't the best thing for them, you're humble enough to tell them that. If it is the best thing for them, you're humble enough to see it from their perspective, exactly like you're saying, and walk them to that acceptable, acceptable yes. And that's a great point right there. There's been several people that I've turned away. Right. I could make money off of them in a heartbeat, or I could really be put them at a disadvantage of, hey, I want to do this. Like, yeah, do you? You might want to right now, but... Is that the best thing? Let's think about this. You yeah. know, let's stop for a second. Let's pause, you know, like we talked about with the seven habits is, you know, let's breathe for a second. Let's look at it and then let's reevaluate and now make a decision. Yeah, I, I, I saw Jeff do that. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that taught me that because I was like you too. I was like, I'm, 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 you're, you're getting it. <laughs> Sign on the line that is dotted, <laughs> you know? I mean, that, that's, that was my approach and I saw Jeff asked somebody about the choice they were making. He felt some hesitancy there and I was at the other end of the table and I was in between meeting with people and and Jeff felt some hesitancy <coughs> with someone and he goes, Hey, does that is that does that fit in your budget? Like is that does that make you a little nervous? And the guy was like, Man, I saw the person breathe a sigh of relief and they were like, Yeah, it's kinda and Jeff was like, Man, come do this and get comfortable with this and then if you, if you know, next time I'm here, or if you want to give me a phone call, we can increase this later. Like he completely took money out of his pocket because it was the best thing for that person. Mm -hmm. And when you do that over and over, people, people see that people, people go, I know that guy left the room and every single person that came in after him was, was, was buying with Jeff, every single one of them, because he established trust, right? right. And their best interest. And yeah, I would absolutely want every transaction to be a zero sum game. I don't want it to be me plus one that you're minus one. Right. You know, I want it to be we're both, you know, we're getting you to the right point that's best for everybody, best for you primarily. That's right. So there's a lot of people that are listening or watching this that are in a position in their life where they're either seeking a new opportunity, a, a new potential sales role, uh, or they may be in one or about to start yeah. uh, a new position. And I think it's so important to have your mindset strong enough to be able to 
understand from the beginning that there are going to be difficulties, like that there are going to be obstacles. Of so think of looking like what 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 sales what what company can I can I get on board with that you know I can have a clear path to success and it's going to be you know simple and easy. And so <laughs> what I would like That's to know that's called fairy tale world. Yeah, exactly. And what I would like to know is you know you being someone that just started a career and excelled very quickly what were some of the biggest obstacles or the biggest what were some of the toughest things that you had to overcome with yourself or what were some of those difficult things that you had to work through amidst success but still were things that were difficult organization number one okay when i've got multiple pieces moving around the board mm -hmm. i am not a puzzle person, I am not, you know, stacking stuff and putting things in conceptually being able to think about multiple things at once. And so breaking it down into the base minutia components of, okay, this is where this puzzle piece goes, this is where this puzzle piece goes, this is where this goes. And articulating that and getting that to a point where I can comprehend it and see that mm -hmm. is tremendous. I know that's getting into a very specific niche example as opposed to the underlying principles, but for me, that was a huge difficulty of, okay, how do I make this call? How do I do this? How do I do this? How do I go to the next one? How do I see this potential opportunity while at the same time maximizing my drive time to the next opportunity? What do I do in the, okay, can I get this opportunity along the way? So a great example is I made a call and went and stopped into an opportunity. It was tiny, tiny, tiny little place. I would just, I would written it off, but it was actually on the way home is on the interstate drive down to Alabama where I'm from. I said, you know what, I'm just going to figure out, see if I can stop on the way. You know, I'll make that a, a part of my journey. That tiny you little. You live in Alabama? No, I'm from from Alabama. I was going oh, okay. to see my mom. Going to see, okay. So I was getting ready to say, dude, I thought you lived in your territory. Yeah. That's <laughs> even harder. It's tough. Yeah. I was getting ready to get down on the floor and just. Oh, man, right. Holy crap! Yeah, I have a tent. I sleep in this. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the beard. Is I've only grown this since I was doing this. But it's warmer. Yeah, that tiny little opportunity though, branched off and spider webbed into four or five other massive opportunities. And so just because I was willing to go and investigate that, and I, again, I hate to say exploit, but to pursue and follow up with that and to chase that one little tiny opportunity, yeah. that jumped into so many other, you know, leverage points to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. And it, so, was, it was funny. That happened with us. I had chased an enormous opportunity for over four years. And, um, and we just got stonewalled at every, every turn. And Nathan and I... Um, worked with a little, it was a little opportunity, and we had no idea that that guy held the keys to the big one hmm. and opened it up. It was, it was beautiful, but that's where it kicks back to that resiliency you talked about. You're resilient. A no is not a no forever, it's just no right now. Right. Everybody's chasing that one big slice of the pie, yeah. but if you start following the crumbs, you're going to find it. You're gonna, yeah. You'll be able to feast on those crumbs. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's awesome. You know what he told me outside? <laughs> You're not going to believe this. Do you know the biggest opportunity that he's had? And we have people that, that work with organizations that have 200, 500, 1,000. What's the biggest one you've done? Uh, 2,000, 1,800. 1,800. And, and he said the biggest opportunity that he has walked into had 36. Hmm. That's awesome. And he thought in the beginning, gosh, my territory sucks. Now what do you think? It's awesome. It's perspective, right? It's outstanding. And I and I I told him that that eighteen hundred or thousand or five hundred is nothing but a bunch of those thirty sixes. Mm -hmm. It's nothing Absolutely. but a hundred of those thirty sixes or fifty of those thirty sixes or smaller mm -hmm. that you stack and you move. And the organization part, while you say that maybe getting down into the minutia, I would say that that's one of the biggest uh, crippling factors in in sales today or in any career, because if, if someone cannot discipline themselves to be organized, opportunity, they don't even see them. Hmm. They don't even see them. Mm -hmm. There's so many missed opportunities, it's unbelievable. That organization, and when you were saying it, I was laughing to myself because that's me. That's me. That was the hardest thing for me, especially early on. You know how many hours are in a week? Not a clue. 168. There's 168 hours in the week. So when somebody tells you, I don't have time to go work out, or I don't have time to do this, I don't have time to make that drive, I don't have time to do these things. Yeah, you really do. It's right. there. You've just got to figure out how to not play on your phone for two hours, not spend some time, you know, driving back. My, my big thing is I drive to Whole Foods to get their peanut butter. I love that. <laughs> but it takes me 20 minutes each way. 
So can I make phone calls on that drive? Can I do this? Can I add that? Can I figure out a way to maximize each one of those moments? Yeah, and that's how, that's when I turned my car into a rolling university. Right. Mm-hmm. So rolling, and it's and it's also my rolling connectivity. It's when it, when I'm in the car, I I don't know that it's ever quiet. And I have time where I get quiet and I meditate and that kind of thing. So I'm not th- I'm not saying that it's not good for that. But when I'm in that car, I'm on the phone nonstop, or I'm listening to a podcast. I'm learning, growing. That's key. That's and back key. to what you just said about not having time, it's funny almost, but certainly interesting that we find time for things that are important. And that if something was truly important, we would make the time. And it just boils down to that they haven't put that level of importance on that thing, which they're saying they don't have time for. Um, But with sales... I only hear the same thing. I was about to comment on that too. When, when, When I hear someone say, I don't have time, that's, I don't hear I don't have time. I hear it's not important to me. It's not important because I think, Steve Jobs had the same 24 hours a day. Same, Mm -hmm. same 24 hours I have. Einstein, same 24 hours I have. Like, what am I doing with mine? Mm -hmm. And that's what separates people. Y'all know I have a second job, right, too? What is that? I clean the gym at night. Do you Mm -hmm. really? I did not know that. You know why? Because now I can work out at night. Hmm. Yeah. Because you have a key. Mm -hmm. That's (laughs) That's So you go in there, work out, clean the gym, that's amazing. That's awesome. uh, if I was cleaning an office building, I don't think they'd like it if I was working <laughs> out in the office, but still, whatever. They got the cameras going, I'd check the cameras in this office building and he's right. pressing the table it's like and doing C2, squats. It's like C2 file cabinets <laughs> going up. Right. Right. Like, like, what's happening in the, in the right. cubicle over there? So you mentioned uh, resiliency. One thing that I think would be important to talk to because in any sales career, in any salesperson, has either dealt with it, is dealing with it, or, or will deal with it in the future is rejection. <laughs> and it can be one of the most crippling things for a lot of people. So when you look at rejection, like what, what is your relationship with rejection at this point? That's a tough one because I don't even recognize it. I mean, I don't even see it as a threat. It's not even, so, okay, cool, that was a no, all right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> that was an actual opportunity. So, yeah. you know, what is a no, new opportunities? Yep. So, I like that. You know, yeah. Wow. You ever heard that? Mm-mm. Like I was told, talking to you about either. that, again, I've never, I don't think I've really ever had a bad life experience. So again, I've had points that I was like, okay, this is where I'm going to take a sharp left-hand turn that I wasn't expecting. Or now is a chance to learn from this opportunity or to be able to move from there. But rejection, cool. It was originally like, all right, I'm going to bring out the battering ram and knock down your castle real quick and see how I'm going to get in. Mm-hmm. Right. All right, now let's figure out a way to get in through the next door. So. Yeah. That little tiny opportunity I was telling you about, that opened up another opportunity that I've been stonewalled at multiple times. Mm -hmm. And had somebody just throw it in my face, I mean, rude to me, mean to me. Well, that person, after that little opportunity, called them and said, hey, you need to stop and listen to this. They called me and said, hey, so what time can you come by, you know, over here? (laughs) Oh, yeah, absolutely. I kept this day open for you. I'm not going to make him eat crow or, you know, throw him in his face. Like, yes, sir, absolutely. And, you know, I'm glad that we can work around your schedule and get you out and take care of. That's incredible. you know what's what's wild is we got thrown we got thrown a curveball in our family where um, Kim's dad was diagnosed with uh, with cancer and it was a crushing crushing mm-hmm. blow um, serious stage four metastasized all all the horrific crap you hear and um, and I talked to him uh, Monday I've never heard him so alive. Hmm. And I was like, Russ, you sound awesome. And he said, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'm wow. connecting with everyone around me. I'm fully present, because he doesn't know what the future looks like. Mm-hmm. So today is the day. Isn't that wild? Mm-hmm. Um, that's a, uh, if we could all, what is that song, Live Like You Were Dying? Mm-hmm. If we could all live in the present like that, yeah. um, man, we would, we would accomplish so much with our lives. And, and so often it is a, a monumental life situation, like a, a diagnosis, a diagnosis of somebody else in the family, yeah. a job loss, a uh, some, Failed big, relationship, some big thing that happens in your life that creates that personal growth and personal development. Um, but for you, what, what is your daily, weekly, monthly, what does personal development or personal growth look like for you? Making my bed. The first thing I do 
to make my bed. That's what Nathan says. Too. Right? I think uh, that was Admiral McRaven that talked yep. about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is the first thing. This sets the standard for the rest of the day. I am making my bed. This is an order. I am in control of this one little fractional moment of my day. All right, what's the next thing I'm doing? All right, I'm going to check uh, my daily tasks for that day. Mm -hmm. All right, what have I got on the docket? What's the next thing I'm doing? So being on top of that. And then just again, going back to having that indomitable mindset of, all right, this is an opportunity, let's maximize it, let's use every moment of this, let's take advantage of this. And so it's not really per se a long-term strategy, more is it just a mindset of, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going in that direction, all right, let's go. I mean, let's take that step, let's keep walking, let's start the hike. Yeah. Are there any other external things like books or podcasts or things that, that you use on a regular basis? Yes. I told you about this one, Cleared Hot by Andy Stump, mm -hmm. Navy SEAL, he was on SEAL Team 6. He was actually on the Jessica Lynch raid where they rescued wow. her. Wow. Uh, he had a long career in uh, the Navy and wound up being wounded in Afghanistan, but he has been a very interesting podcast to listen to. Mm -hmm. And somebody who did not go to college, didn't have formal education, how articulate he is, mm -hmm. has been a very eye-opening experience of like, oh wow, this person's very intelligent with outside the parameters of what we normally construe as intelligence. Mm -hmm. right. But he talks about when he was a BUDS instructor with the Navy SEALs about how to get guys to quit. Yep. So how could he make those trainees, those guys that are trying to become Navy SEALs quit? Mm -hmm. And he figured out that he, if he could expand their world, then they would quit. Hey, how long can you be cold for? Can you be cold for the next six months? We're out here in the ocean. Are you gonna be able to swim for this for the next 378 days? Are you gonna be able to, do you really think you can do this? And he said the ones that could not get in their head, they couldn't you know, pick away at them, that they focused on, hey, I've got three hours till lunch. Hmm. I need to get through the three, next three hours. All right, after that, I've got three hours till dinner. I've got to get through this three hours. He said the ones that he could not get to break that mindset, he could never make them quit. Yep. But if he could make you pull back, oh my gosh, this thing's so big, this is such an indomitable task, they would just ring that bell and they'd be gone. And so that is one of my number one. That's a very specific example. Mm -hmm. But to talk about on the broad, spectrum of that of, you know, how am I getting better is, all right, what books am I reading? How am I improving every single day? How am I improving my mindset? I hate the idea that I'm losing knowledge, that I'm losing ground. Mm -hmm. I think about things or, you know, I'll remember something and like, man, I hadn't thought about that in a while. Or, I remember that from seventh grade or I remember this, mm -hmm. or I remember this from law school or I remember this, this and this. Crap, I haven't used that in a while. I need to bring that back. And so how do I keep adding to my repertoire? How do I keep adding to my vernacular, to my, uh, my personal inventory, my personal library? So. Every day I'm working on that, but again, Cleared Hot, great podcast. Everybody listen to that one. Yeah. That's a plug for him, but you know, trying to find ways like that to improve myself. Mm -hmm. And so books as well. One of my favorite books is, I'm going to butcher the title because it's a long title, but Never Settle. It's by Chris Voss. He was a hostage negotiator hmm. for wow. the FBI. Oh yeah, I've heard of him. Yep. Very good book. So highly mm -hmm. recommend reading that one. Uh, that one and then... How to Win Friends and Influence People, one of the classics. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that is a very good one on that, but yeah, those are two of my, my go-tos. Yeah. You awesome. know, it's funny you say that about that Navy SEAL. Um, Tom Shea says that he said it a little bit different, but it's exactly the same. So how he got people to quit and when he was training them in San Diego was he would always move, move the mark, never let them finish. So expand their world. He, finishing was never an option. Winning winning was never an option, mm -hmm. right? So if he said run a mile after they've been in cold water for three hours and hypothermia setting in, they would get close to the mile and they would move the mile, right? Mm -hmm. And so same thing, expanding their world. And what it boils down to is they started and they said they were going to finish no matter what. And so are you a person of your word? Do you stick to your word when there's no chance of winning or success? Right? Do you keep taking the step forward? And I was like, why do, you, why do you do that? And he said, because in his missions in Afghanistan and Iraq, every single mission he went on with the SEAL teams, they ran out of food, water, ammunition, and any chance of success. Mm -hmm. But they succeeded. Because they had learned to keep moving forward, you have to do something. Why? Because I said I was going to. Right, mm. honoring your word—it's that's that's it's a powerful lesson for people to learn. You know, one of the reasons why we started this podcast in the very beginning was to really give support and show appreciation for salespeople um, because it's hard. 
it's a difficult profession. It's an honorable profession. But one of the major difficulties for most in sales is loneliness. Mm -hmm. You can feel like you're out there on an island all by yourself, especially if you're in a position where you're having to travel a lot. And whether it's in the car a lot by yourself or it's in hotel rooms by yourself, that's one of the biggest things that mentally will wear on people and will mm -hmm. ultimately affect their performance. So my question to you would be over the last you know, couple of months, what are some of the ways that you've combated that feeling or not allowed the emotions of being by yourself affect your performance and keeping focused on you know, the long-term goals? So obviously in this profession, it's a lot of windshield time, a lot of drive time. And like you said, turning the car into a virtual library, turning it into a university on wheels. So taking advantage of that time to occupy my mind, to be learning something, to be actively, proactively going on something and to be expanding my brain. But I use that time to call friends that I haven't talked to in a while. Yeah. Call the family I haven't talked to in a while. You know, hey mom, what's going on? How are you doing? I fill that gap. I absolutely fill that void. And then as well, when I'm talking to a potential opportunity, when I'm talking to a group of people, yeah. I try to actually get to know them. And I try to actually use that as an opportunity of, hey cool, I know somebody in Dare County now. Yeah. Do you know anybody in Dare County? Probably not. <laughs> Probably <laughs> right. not. Because no. there's only four of them. <laughs> right. And they have the same last name as me, so we all get along. <laughs> but go you know, with that. And then, you know, I try to use that just to make a new friend to listen to somebody. Mm -hmm. And I do that too. And I, I catch myself because, you know, I like to talk, I like to get involved with them. But it's shutting up and letting them tell their story. Mm -hmm. And so I learn something every single time, you know, when I get to talk to those people. And that gives me a chance to be able to feel like I've connected with somebody, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm out on the road. and. You know, when you're out there driving, doing all those things by yourself, there's always the ever-present threat of nailing the tire, breaking down in the middle of nowhere, you know, not knowing right. anybody out here. Something happened. I happened to, you know, mess up my car on one of these drives and totaled it in the process. I don't know if I told you that, but it's clunking, driving back home at 60 miles an hour, dragging bumpers and everything else. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I was like, good Lord, I'm out here in the middle of nowhere. Nobody's going to come get me. I'm in a state that I don't have any family in. I know a handful of the people, and of that handful, even smaller number that would come out here at one in the morning to come get me. You know, all right, how do I you know, mitigate that? How do I develop a community across an entire state? Yeah. And so I've since been able to take advantage of that and absolutely uh, develop, you know, a group of people that you know, hopefully they feel I can call me at any moment, or yeah. if they need anything, they can shout at me, or if I needed something, I can give them a shout. And so that's really been the chance to, even though you know I may see that person for two years. Mm -hmm. You know, still getting them, hey, you know, director, what's going on? How are you? Getting to talk to them. Yep. And just immediately picking right back up. But that's that's really it. So. Yeah. yeah, we've lost a, a lot of it in Western civilization. We've lost that community, that community feel and relationships. And it's it, it plays into what we talk about sometimes about, well, that's personal. This is business. And, and I say it all the time. There is no difference. It's all personal. And, and we said it in our, in our company meeting in there, humankind, be both. Be both human and kind to the people, connect with people. Um, you know, a lot of people separate their work and their personal lives. And I venture to say there is no separation, it's all personal. It's relationships, it's relationships. And do you care? And are you showing them that you care? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's a cliche, but it's an absolute fact. This is one to you know, backtrack a little bit, but I've always had the mantra that nobody will ever improve until they've suffered. True. You will never get stronger until you suffered. You'll never appreciate your wife until you've had a bad part in your marriage. You'll never appreciate you know, how good this bottle of water tastes until you've been without water. And so I hated people, I hate people. <laughs> like, I just want to be in a cabin out in the woods. You know, Ted Kaczynski could be down the road for me. It doesn't matter. You know, just as long as he doesn't talk to me, I don't care. <laughs> but then I went with, you know, not being around my normal core group of people, not being around people constantly, inundated constantly. And so actually appreciating when I go out and talk to the people on the road and actually get out, you know, not being, you know, in that environment where you're constantly inundated with mm -hmm. human interaction. Like, hey, man, I kind of appreciate this now. Like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, I kind of miss some people. You know, suffering a little bit of, you know, that loneliness yeah. makes you appreciate those around you so much more. Yeah. And, you know, having a failed relationship and then appreciating those of people that are rallied around you that, you know, came to your aid during that moment when you're one of your darkest in your life. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to that loneliness again. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, man, I'm so glad that I've got this core and group of community. Mm -hmm. And so it's just maximizing that, having that mindset of, 
you know, this is an opportunity for me to make a new friend, to me to make a new relationship. Yep. It's crazy. I, um, the perspective in my head shifted on that, and it's been shifting, but I always felt alone. I felt alone when I was in the field selling because I was by myself. I thought that's why I felt alone, but it was a perspective shift because when I came in, and, I'm, and, and now with my role, I'm around people all the time. And, and I used to tell Kim this, I would be like, it's from a song somewhere, I'm never alone, but I'm alone all the time. And, and, but that was my own perspective because of the way I saw it. And recently, I was thinking about that word alone and, and it separated, it separated. And it was one and all. And another L just dropped in there, all one. You're not alone. If, you're con if you connect with people, then you're never alone. And there's always someone there. And, and it's just, it's very, very unique to shift your own perspective in that, in that especially in a sales role, um, where, you're, where you're out beating the streets and, and, and doing work um, by yourself. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but it was just, that was unique that happened in my own head. And I don't feel alone anymore. Like in a group of people, I used to feel alone. Like, oh, they don't understand what I'm going through. Well, yeah, yeah. You, do you understand what they're going through? <laughs> right? right? Like, I mean, really. To tie back into a point we made previously about rejection, mm -hmm. you never know what that person's going through. Nope. You never know, you know, why that guy's being a jerk to you. He may have just buried his child the day before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He may be going through a struggling divorce or something like that. And so having that mentality of, Okay, you're a jerk to me. Okay, then, you know, I'm still going to maintain my standard. All right, I'm still going to be kind to you. I'm going to show you compassion. I'm going to try to show you my best effort that I possibly can because I don't know what you're going through. Right. And so I'm not going to pretend like you're going through the same thing. I guess that'd be narcissism to assume that you're in the same world as I am. Right. So trying to step back and think about that of, okay, like, calm down. Like, I don't know what his struggles are. I don't know what his path is right now. So, you know, it's crazy you say that. I, I was in an organization one time and it was probably. 15, 20 people, and one of the guys there, um, and I was assuming it was his wife beside him, but he was, he was just bitter. And when it came time for me to meet with them and talk about life insurance, they came back. And I was already a little, you know, I'd, I had perceived that he was a jerk, right? And, and when they came back and talked with me, they had just buried their son, their 18-year-old son, and they told me the story through tears and everything, and I was like, oh my gosh, I couldn't have been more wrong, mm -hmm. you know? And it's those perspective shifts, because you never know what, what people are going through, exactly what you said. And they need you to reach out through kindness. And if what you have is the best thing for them, they'll make that decision there. But if you're connected to them and you're kind, and you and you just walk through that process it's it's we don't make those snap decisions there those judgments where where we m perceive somebody oh that guy's just a jerk he hates everybody around him i'm you know and then we put up our defenses because he's gonna be a jerk to me i'll be a jerk back you know and and you just never know what they've what they've been through or what they're going through at that exact moment well it's just if you thought what would the world look like if everyone just gave everyone the benefit of the doubt yeah, yeah, my wife says, assumed good best. intention. Yeah. There you go. She's so nice, though. I'm like, assumed good intention. Like, by the way, that's hard. that song was Glycerine by Bush. It's a great song. It's a great song. <laughs> I have that on my playlist. <laughs> that's, you're exactly right. One yeah. thing I wanted to mention, so <laughs> what we've realized two years into this podcast is that, you know, it was created as a sales podcast for obvious reasons. It's called The Sales Wolves. But we have so many people that listen and watch that aren't in sales. And because the, you know, the things that we're talking about are universal to any industry or they're just universal to life. But what I know is that of those people that aren't in sales that are listening in and, and watching, that some of them are considering it. And some of them maybe have that gut feeling or just that itch that maybe I should try sales. And I think a lot of times what, what where the hesitation comes from is their experience and their background and what they've done before and it may be something completely different. So I think it'd be interesting to get your viewpoint on coming from your background, which is very different. Lawyer. And, and I would say very different 
across the board for someone in that industry to then go into sales, how maybe that experience was for you and then how also it may have benefited the way that you go through your daily tasks of obviously performing at a very high level in sales. So again, going from a previous background of going into the legal profession, it was very much, oh, you don't want to comply? Well, let's go ahead and get you subpoenaed then. Let's get that taken care of. <laughs> oh, you don't want to do this? Well, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. So there's going to be a sheriff's deputy here tomorrow. So <laughs> go, yeah, going from that mindset to, oh, I can't force you to do something. Mm -hmm. Again, I've got to get you to the point where this is the most beneficial thing for you and you understand why that's beneficial. Yeah. That was a huge shift in perspective on that. And realizing it just from a personal standpoint of like, man, I really don't like that old profession. <laughs> if I had to sit in front of a desk for the rest of my life, it would not be a long life. I would not be here for much longer. It was miserable. Don't want to do that. So going back to, you know, spend a lot of time on the road, you know, drive and do those things. Well, the alternative was a whole lot worse. So I would take this over that any day. But to, you know, say how that previous profession played into this one, it's really not. I mean, I can't really say it's not even apples and oranges. It's like a banana to an orange or something, yeah. whatever, yeah. diametrically opposed. So there's not a whole lot in the way that could be translated to this new profession. So I didn't really have any way to carry over any previous tips or tricks or anything yeah. like that. So that was kind of nice to come into this and say, clean slate, okay, this is how we do it. This is our system. This is what we need to do. Cool. <laughs> all go. right, like, all right, let's roll with it. So I'm not trying to reinvent a wheel, you know, from previous, you know, points of information and running from that with that going forward of, all right, here's our wheel, just roll it and doing it from there. So that has been a really fun process and I haven't think about it. Hindsight 2020, I probably should have joined the Army coming out of high school. If here's what we're gonna do, do it. Okay, great, like I don't have to think about this, awesome. Mm -hmm. So just a mindset of that, but and I know that was a long tangent on that, so. No, no, that makes perfect sense and it actually leads right into my next question. You know, everything that we do within our organization is so systematic. You know, we have a system for every single element, every single environment, every single part of the process and you already just spoke to it a little bit, but what? how have you felt being able to plug into a system has been the catalyst for your success? I do want to backtrack one more point on what we just previously made, so I apologize, digressing. Mm -hmm. People that are thinking about getting into sales, that are thinking about going into a profession that would be involved and you know, have a hesitancy or a mindset of, oh, I don't know if I'll be good at this, or I don't know if I want to try it. What's the worst that's gonna happen? Mm -hmm. What's the worst that's going to happen if you walk up to that girl and ask her out? Mm -hmm. She'll laugh at you. You'll never see her again. You're embarrassed. You know, who cares? You know, five years from now, no one's going to remember it. Six months from now, no one's going to remember it. So why not try? Why not step out into the darkness? You know, you'll yep. be amazed. You know, climb that mountain. You'll be amazed at the views that you get to see. Yep. So why not? You know, who, who really cares? We only got a very short time. I mean, I'm 33, so at best I'm one third of my life's over mm -hmm. if I make it to 99 or whatever. So why not, you know, live every day and, and go out and do something that scares you. Yep. Do something that ventures out into the darkness. But I totally no, forgot what your, your next question was. It was yeah, funny, so, Tom, Tom yeah. Shea said something to that point when I was headed to Poland to, to, to do this whole adventure. And, and he, said, he said, adventure with no safety net is truly living life. Mm -hmm. I booked that a from a Navy yeah. SEAL. I booked a flight to Cuba. Just went down to Cuba. I love it. Just wanted to see Cuba. <laughs> was it awesome? Yeah, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful dichotomy of decay and just natural beauty. Yeah. So not to get into a political statement, but the decay of socialism, communism, yeah. and then just this beautiful Caribbean country. So getting to see those sites, and that was right before the travel ban was issued you know, probably eight or nine months ago to where nobody can go back there now. Yeah. So the fact that I pulled the trigger, took a chance, and went down there and visited mm -hmm. you know, a isolated country and got the chance to see that, you know, how many people can say they've been to Cuba? Not many. How many people have walked the streets of Havana and drank a mojito? Yeah. So. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, so in regards to systems, I think the important thing would be just to talk about for that person that's looking at going into sales or for any salesperson evaluate, evaluating opportunities with different companies, how important is it? to have a successful system with a track record, and how did that enable you to kind of hit the ground running? 
I take the mindset that somebody else paid for this lesson. Somebody else had to figure this out. Somebody else. Those had somebody to. else's are sitting in the fucking <laughs> room with you, yeah. just so you know. <laughs> right. And so that would be borderline disrespectful to both of you to say, "Hey, you know what? I've only been doing this six weeks. I know a lot better than you. Let me go ahead and tell you why I'm going to do better than this." And so you paid for those lessons, and a lot of sweat, and a lot of tears, and a lot of failures. Now, taking that system. All right. Here's my structure. Here's how I build off of it. You know, I think of myself as Ivy. You know, grow up that wall, grow up that structure, and keep on going and figure out how to flourish. And so I take that approach of yeah, awesome. Beautiful. Somebody else had the chance to, or wisteria, that's a little prettier, I think, you know, the purple flowers. Yeah. So, yeah, right. You, not bad for a guy from Alabama that can barely read. And so being able to take that system that you built and to... No idea, he was a horticulturist, right? right? Yeah. Botany is my free time. You want to think of that? Botany and biceps, that's, that's what you'll remember me as. So, Double Bs. The there you go. <laughs> Botany and biceps. So being able to, yeah. I can't. Just totally went off on that one. But Rabbit hole. To be, yeah. To be able to take your system and to be able to take what other people have learned, you know, that would be hubris to say that I've got a better system, that I can think better on that. I like to take that system and then figure out how can I improve it. Mm -hmm. Not how can I reinvent it, not how can I break it down, not how can I subvert it. Is okay, how can I improve this? So using a system, using a computer system, you know, not to go into a specific on this, but an application system where it's electronically based. All right, I have to type in certain information at certain points. All right, how do I figure out how I can do control A, you know, whatever command function to where it automatically populates in that section so it saves me time. Yep. That would be an example of how do I improve the system on, how do right. I figure out how to work it more efficiently, you know, and so to add back to that system, it would be hugely critical to have a system. So always embrace it, always take it and then make it your own and then figure out how you can make it better. Yep. So again, not trying to demolish it, not trying to go yep. around it, but how can you grow off of it? Yeah, that's beautiful. How you can ivy it. Right. Flourish. Climb into the sunlight. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that is true. Go towards the light. Go mm -hmm. towards the That's light. What it's all about. Man, this has been awesome. And uh, we appreciate you being here. And it's nice to publicly, not just in our office, but to publicly be able to um, value, not just value you, but to be able to show appreciation to you for the work that you put in. Because we know what that looks like. And it's insanely difficult because just because you have a system that is simple, does not mean that the job is easy. <laughs> That's true. And and it's, you know, anyone that can plug into a system but have the other side of that create massive, massive results takes an insane amount of work, sacrifice, discipline, and all those things. And that's what this entire podcast is all about, is helping people get to a place where they can plug into something and have good results and then go to great results and then just keep growing and keep being hungry uh, for more beyond that. So man, I appreciate you being here. Yeah, That's thank awesome. you and congratulations. Absolutely. Cool, man. Thank you. So with that guys, this is the Sales Wolves Podcast episode 154. As always, I'm your host, Tyler Harris. Joseph Caldwell. And today we've got... Evan Wilson. And we are the Sales Wolves. Ow! Ow!